Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Secret Resume Podcast, hosted by me, Melody Moore. In this podcast, we explore the people, places, and experiences that have shaped my guests, those which have influenced who they are as people and where they are in their work life today. You can listen in as we have a rich exploration of often unexamined and undiscussed, but very important aspects of their lives, or as I like to call it, their secret resume. My guest today is Ollie Phillips. Ollie is a director at PwC and founder of Optimist Performance, where he delivers team building, leadership and personal development training. You may also know Ollie as a former England rugby captain. He's a four times world record holder and has raised over £2.5 million for charity. Welcome, Ollie. Really excited to have you here today uh, to talk about your story. We've talked a little bit beforehand and it sounds absolutely fascinating. So I'm really excited that you're here. Thanks, Manadi. Delighted myself. I was more relieved that you didn't fall asleep when obviously I recounted my story. So <laughs> hopefully we have more of the same um, with some of the listeners on this one. <laughs> Brilliant. Yes. No, no falling asleep allowed. So, Ollie, um, let's start with... Uh, you telling us just a little bit about yourself, what you do, who you are, and then uh, we'll go back to back to the beginning. Yeah, sure. Um, well, my name's Ollie Phillips. My, I, well, my proudest thing right now, I'm a dad, which is the, the critical bits. Um, dad of three children, husband to an incredible wife um, or, or lady even, um, uh, called Lucy. Uh, we've got three kids, Alfie, and Nia and Lily May, um, and prof- that's my personal side. Professionally, uh, I am a director at Pricewaterhouse Cooper. I am the founder of a behavioral change business called Optimist Performance, uh, and I have a property development business with my wife called SPOD Properties. So that's me in a sort of professional capacity. I've just finished a stint as the head of performance for Team China. Um, having been based out in China during COVID, which is always interesting, um, and now back in the bosom of the UK, which has got its own chaos. There you go. It's got its own chaos, <laughs> different man. kind of chaos. Yeah, a different kind of chaos. You sound like a very busy man, so I'm very pleased that you managed to find some time to talk to me. That's great. It's really nice to be here. Fun. Brilliant. So let's uh, leap right back to the beginning for you. As uh, as everybody does, we're talking about people and places and experiences that have had an impact on you and who you are. Um, so let's start with little Ollie, your family. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so when, when we had our little warm up chat around this, I think I just turned 40 in uh, in September, even though I look about 60. I mean, my nickname was Benjamin Button when I was playing. So um, <laughs> I'm hoping I look like Brad Pitt soon, but I'm running out of run, runway at the moment. Um, but yeah, I, I, it prompted a bit of a reflection. And if I'm honest, my life feels like it has been crystallized into into decade stints, ironically. Um, and so the, you know, the first 10 years of my life was, was a very happy one, if I'm honest. Um, younger brother uh, living in Brighton, seaside town, and... Yeah, grew up with a, a fairly happy and and settled sort of family unit, if you like, my, with my mum and dad sort of being married to each other. My dad was very successful, so we had a pretty nice life and lived in a nice house and all that sort of jazz. So my first 10 years were filled with love, colour, fun, um, a bit of, you know, I, I mean, a lot of sport. But but I, if I were to reflect on those first 10 years of my life, there was definitely a, um, yeah, a settled period, if you like. Hmm. And does sport run in the family? You said a lot of sport. Um, an active family, but nothing in terms of sort of professional level. My dad was a very good marathon runner, to be fair to him. He, he you know, he ran a sub three hour marathon. So he was a relatively sort of fit, fit bloke. Um, but but I think that also demonstrates or comes across probably in some of the later bits we'll, we'll, I'll probably talk about. But, you know, I, I think that stems from him being a bit of an obsessive character. So as a result of that, you know, if he was going to, you know, if he was set on running three hours, he's going to run sub three hours. Um, so, you know, but but equally, you know, loved his sport, loved his rugby and 
for me and my brother in particular I think rugby at the age of four or five became an outlet that my mum could basically farm me out and instead of me bashing the living daylights out of my brother my younger brother you know, somebody else could do it to me um, and I could get rid of some of that boisterous energy that I needed just to sort of wear off every weekend and I was hopeless at football two left feet so and I, they always put me in goal so that was always an indication that I wasn't going to be any good at playing <laughs> football so thankfully I could play rugby and if you like my love for team sports teamship being in an environment with lots of people surrounded by activity fun and obviously at the root of that rugby and that started very early for me that was from the age of four that's very young to start playing rugby. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I say rugby. It's obviously, you know, touch and tag and you know, basically give the ball to one person and everyone r- runs around them like bees around a honeypot. So, you know, not rugby as, as everyone knows it, but um, but just definitely an outlet, if you like, for activity and mm-hmm. a place where I could get um, a lot of energy out of my system, but also start to understand the pros and cons of competition, the benefits that come from being diligent and focused and trying hard and and then also the, the great thing that comes with teams and winning as a collective I, I, I definitely really really started to enjoy those moments you know I would be that kid that would be absolutely devastated and distraught if we lost yeah, and and over the moon like fist pumping and high-fiving as if I've just you know won the world cup having won whatever Hove mini rugby under sevens tournament or something. They're, <laughs> they're very passionate about the team and winning and being competitive. Okay. Are you a nightmare to play board games with? Yes. Yeah, I am. I mean, I love it, but I am a nightmare. My wife always, actually, my wife says this all the time because I always win. Um, and I don't know, it's, I mean, I don't know why that happens, if I'm honest, but but I am very competitive at it. So if we play Monopoly and things like that, you know, we've had instances where my mum will flip the Monopoly board over because I've charged her too much rent or something like that on her. So we try to avoid that in the household. But um, yeah, I, I've definitely mellowed. And as I've got older, I, I have, as we go through this this chat, if you like the decade stints, I would notice a, a marked difference in my if you like, my last decade compared to probably the middle two for mm-hmm. me in terms of my competitive nature and my appetite to to win. So let's move to your next decade then. So it's at 10 years old, things changed quite a bit for you. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think hopefully not everybody who listens to this, but a lot of people who have been through it, you know, a separated divorced family or whatever else will will resonate with this but my, mine came at the age of 10 11 years of age for me so I, I would say that's probably one of the most challenging ages not I mean there isn't ever a, a great age for that to happen but where I think at the age of 10 11 you understand what's happening in terms of a practical sense like dad's not here anymore you don't really understand why and you can't and you can't really be told the reasons why. Um, and so all you get really is a lot of confusion, a lot of frustration, a lot of anger to towards people, right? Toward, you know, and resentment towards my mum. You know, I, I, I blamed her a lot for you know, making my dad leave and all the rest of it. And the reality is, you know, my dad was, you know, not a good, good person in terms of fidelity and whatever else in, in the relationship. So, um, you know, so, so I think those if you like the first five years, 10 to 15, it's were very, very troubling for me. Um, unsettling for me around mm. just not really understanding why this perfect bubble that I'd grown up in for sort of 10 years had suddenly been burst. And then, and here I was missing, if you like the, the person that I kind of idolized and grown up with and you know, it wasn't there anymore. And it wasn't just, he wasn't there. We didn't see him for like two years, even though he was living a mile down the road you know, so so like a very sort of challenging time it's coupled with then obviously mm. you know my mum and dad separating and my mum meeting new people and you know I remember she had she had a, a boyfriend of hers really good guys when we still sort of chat with now but I know he used to play a game called wall ball you know where you kick a ball against the wall and there was a target 
and I was absolutely obsessed with this game. Loved it. But because he was my, he was like an intruder or whatever, I refused to talk to him. So for, I think it was probably two years, not far off. Like, and when I say refuse, like, I mean, I wouldn't say a word to him. I wouldn't even acknowledge he was there. And, um, and but I would ask my brother, because I love this game so much. I'd be like, Addy, can you ask um, Paul if we could play war ball? Because, you know, so like that sort of, whatever you want to call it, torment in my mind as to how I how I met how I met meddle through this and manage through this sort of challenging period for me of like ah uh, yeah uh, there's a replacement for my dad or whatever else which obviously you know it wasn't but but you know a, a very confusing time and when you mm. and I understand why now with you know how old I am you couldn't really be told about the things that happen because they're not very nice um and so you just have to sort of accept, you know, dad's not going to be around anymore and, you know, la, 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 la. So I, mm. I found that period in a personal perspective, very unsettling. And what materialized in that, if you like in the first, that was about that 10 years, but the first five years were particularly troubling. And rugby then became a very, very significant factor in my life because what I'd lost in terms of support, validation, love recognition praise and whatever else in terms of a you know father figure i'd gained through sport and in particular through rugby and that wasn't just rugby but i mean i i was very sporty so i remember at, at the age of 14 15 i was playing county squash rugby athletics cricket i was playing divisional and national hockey rugby i was running southeast england I, I was i was national water polo i mean i was literally the energizer bunny i mean every hour that i had spare i was doing sport did you have any time for school um you know what I, I, it was ironic i did and if anything if you like 14 to 16 or 17 were, were like the, the bumper years for me where i don't know everything i seemed to touch would turn to gold i mean I mean, not not literally, but you know, I, I would. My at fourteen, you start to become county, England under sixteens, all this sort of stuff. So I'm in that sort of framework for rugby. I'm captain for Sussex, our county. So I've got lots of players, dads, school, all telling me like, I'm great, and you're going to go far, and you're going to be brilliant. You're going to do this on a rugby front, same on a hockey front, same on a water polo front, same on an athletics front. So same on a cricket front, selected for Sussex under 19s. And so everything is positive momentum. In my GCSEs, I get two A stars, six A's, two B's. And then and then probably, well, not probably, definitely at 16, 17, when you get into sixth form, I got a bit, I had arrogance probably overdoing it. I was just overconfident and, and my focus got lost. So I focused on all the things that I just was super passionate about sports, CCF, which is basically the military stuff, like being in the army. I got voted as, I got nominated as cadet of the country and whatever it was, whenever I was at school, 1999 or 2000 or whatever it was. So if you like being physical and being active became this big uh, avenue for me of support and also a big, you know, I call it a distraction. And then at the same time, at the age of 16, girls came into the world, which um, when you've got a face that only your mother can love, you know, you want to you want to you want to leverage whatever you can in that situation. And and so, you know, being the I don't know, captain for rugby and playing for England and getting a contract at Harlequins and da da da, da you know, you sort of revel in all that nonsense. But what it meant was I neglected my studies, I neglected my A-levels and I was forecast and it. A A A B, I think it was. And I was going to go to the London School of Economics to study economic history with economics. I mean, I was going to be that boring, Melody. Um, trust me. Or more boring. Uh, I got a BBD, basically. So that was, you know, disaster days. Uh, you know, it was not that you know bad overall, but in terms of what the expectation was and what I delivered was very, very, you know, poor. And I think at that point at 18, I, somebody shone down on me and gave me a bit of luck because... Um, the uh, London School of Economics said no. 
and I had to make a relatively big call because Harlequins had offered me a, at the time a £35,000 contract and that was ridiculous at 18 years of age. And I just, there's something in my gut that told me, look, if I go and do this, if I go to university or if I go to something in London, you know, LSE was in the Strand and Quinn's was in Aldershot and economic history with economics, having just got a D in economics, there was no chance I was going to be going to the Strand. So I just thought, look, I need to, I need to go and do something here. And fortuitously, Durham were my, originally my second choice on my, UCAS or whatever and they said we'll accept you on the course so I went up to do a BA in business up at Durham University having never been up there never seen the university nothing and obviously been in I was in Brighton so going five six hours up north but it was kind it was it turned out to be the best decision I ever made in my life if I'm honest but in terms of my friends group my growing up my maturity but um but yeah it, it was a uh, I went up there and you know, the rest from that point on was history. So what happened with the rugby then? So you had, had been offered a contract at Harlequins. Was that to play full time or would you have still gone to university at the same time? Yeah, I mean, conceptually it was to still go to university, but I can guarantee you there's not a chance I'd have gone from Aldershot to the Strand for one lecture on a Thursday afternoon or wherever it might be. So yes, hypothetically and theoretically, I would have gone and done the and done the two but ha, I think that was the thing from a behavioral perspective my A-level results made me realize I've got the balance of power here wrong and I need I've now if you like my GCSEs have done I've gone well my A-levels I've cocked up I need to write this wrong so that maybe in the long run if you know if I get injured or whatever else in rugby there's something to fall back on and I've got some job stabilities because I just figured like if I went to a job interview with a you know whatever eight a's it's eight a's and whenever it was two a stars at gcse a botched a levels but then a two one or a first from a big red brick university like an lse or a durham they could be like oh what was the anomaly in the middle whereas if i'd just gone gcse's cocked up my a levels and then nothing it, it would have been a much harder narrative so i i decided to go and flip the switch and luckily unfortunately Durham still had a very good you know, rugby program I decided to commit to the rugby at this point and I thought well I'll go up play I was getting in on the back of rugby as well that's what I you know they sort of said we'll overlook some of your results um and yeah so, so I went up there to do that and make sure that I came away with a you know, minimum 2-1 a couple of questions come to mind. One is, why did you choose to focus on rugby? Because it sounds like you were good at lots of sports. So what was it about rugby that made you commit to that? Um, yeah, really good question, because I mean, I could have gone, I, th I think it was probably the level of professionalism. I could have gone into cricket. Um, I was Sussex under 19 cricketer and uh, there was definitely some momentum in that. But I, I guess I never really felt that I was really good at that you know, I felt like I was good at it and I was competitive I played for our first 11 cricket team from the age of 15 so I, I I knew that I could bowl and stuff but I didn't I never really properly understood the game and I wasn't passionate about it I saw other players we, I was fortunate at my school we had like an England cricketer who ended up playing loads as a wicketkeeper a guy called Matt Pryor you know and, I, and he was in the set team with me and I just remember I remember always looking at him going this kid lives and breathes this I mean, there's nothing he would rather do than cricket. And if my passion was the total, I, if I were to look at myself, I was the total the other way, but with rugby. And and so I just, you know, at the time, I really enjoyed the game. I understood the game. I was very good at the game and got a lot of validation and self-worth out of the game. And I, I really enjoyed the camaraderie. I, I found, the, if you like, the physical battle of going you know, head to head and a bit of physical contact more appealing and more satisfying with a group of people than it was cricket. And I felt that cricket was, I, I, I see it now. It's not quite the same. It is, it is a very much a team game, but I felt cricket was more an individual game. Like 
if I'm batting, it's on me and I've got to bat my way through. And if I'm bowling, it's on me and I've got to bowl exactly where I need to, to try and get this person out. Um, whereas rugby, I found it was, you know, there are, it's now the similar parallels, but at the time that was just my reflection, I think. That sounds like you made some quite sensible, rational decisions at that point. Were there people in your life who were advising you on that? Or was it something you just went in a darkened room and thought about? Yeah, it was quite a lonely time, if I'm honest. So, um, yeah, so the outcome of my A-levels was obviously absolutely car crash. My dad going apoplectic at me. And this had also been preceded by probably six months to a year before my dad walking into the school and telling the headmaster that um, I'd had a school report that wasn't very good in my lower sixth year. So building into my final year. And my dad, who'd never shown any interest in my schooling at all, decided that this was the moment he was going to and stormed into the school. And then basically everything that I'd worked for for like five, six years at school, he tore up in about an hour with the headmaster. So, you know, I was desperate to be the first 15 rugby captain. I was desperate to be the head boy for the school. And he walked into the headmaster's office and said, he's not doing any of this stuff. And I remember being very disappointed in the headmaster because he agreed with them. And so I just walked in. They told me and I just, I used an expletive beginning with C, both of them, which I've never used in my life before or since. Um, and walked out and then luckily there was an absolute legend of a Welsh guy who was our head of rugby at the time, a guy called John Pope. And Popey turned around to the headmaster and said, there's no way he's not being the captain or something. So he made me the, he said, I'm ignoring what you're saying and made me the captain of the rugby, but I, but I wasn't made the head boy, um, which, you know, now in hindsight is an irrelevance, right? <laughs> but but at the time, it's obviously, you know, a, a, an earthquake happening in your life. And, and so I think if you like that, that decade of my life, um, was filled with lots of disruptive moments like that. Very unstable, um, irregular, emotive moments, if you like, that were often fueled, well, definitely fueled by my dad, but 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 our family environment. My mum was brilliant, and my mum, my brother, and I, we lived, you know, lived together. We call ourselves the three amigos, but um, but I still think, as a boy growing up, you know, you look to your your dad as as the sort of you know key figure or whatever else and particularly given the context that i'd had of the 10 years of him being the key figure and then for him to just go the total polar opposite you know to be very to be very absent to be very inconsistent to be very unsupportive not very loving um you know that was challenging and yeah, I mean, his medium, his way of demonstrating support or love was money. And yeah, you know, and that was, I am very grateful now, you know, him paying for my school fees, I'm very grateful for. But at the time, obviously, you don't, as a 15 year old, you don't think of it. I'm like, look, you know, I don't, I don't understand what this is. All I actually care about is whether you're nice to me or not, or whether you say well done, or whether you come and watch my rugby games, or whether you come and congratulate me for getting man of the match or, being made captain for my county or winning my race or whatever it is, right? Being present, basically. And and that was just not the case. So so as a result, sport became the crutch. Sport became the avenue of like, okay, I, I didn't realise this at the time, but, but that became the, okay, I'm not, I don't get this, I don't get this feeling that I need or I'm used to having as a naught to 10 year old. But wow, this this world of sports gives me that, gives me that self confidence, gives gives me that validation that I need. So you had it when you were little, and then that next ten years sounds like you were really seeking that validation. You got it from the sport because you weren't getting it from your dad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think when you go through an uncertain time right you you look for things that help bring you stability and and certainty and comfort and whatever else and having been in a period of of great comfort and good stability as as a child going then into adolescence i i was surrounded by instability and uncertainty and 
irregular behavior and absenteeism and whatever else. And as a result of that, I just, I didn't know where to turn. You know, my mum tried to be brilliant and she was amazing, but I still, you know, sometimes when people are overly supportive and overly interested in you, you almost resent them. Because like, I because you look at things like, I know that's not very good. So don't tell me it's very good. Yeah, I know I'm not, that's not very good. I know I can do better. Um, so, you know, so, you know, it wasn't her fault in the slightest, but, you know, that was definitely a period, those 10 years of, you know, let's call it roller coaster ride. And as I, particularly from 10 to 15, and then as I went through 15 to 20, if you like, sport became this big focal point that I could now start to get a lot of certainty from. Um, and as I say, towards the end of it, 17, 18, that balance became, you know, imbalanced. And I, ne I neglected certain areas that um, could and 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 are very influential on the on the future of your life. And I still find I still find it crazy that as an eighteen year old, well, you, you know, you don't know what you're doing. If I'm honest, you you can make decisions or mistakes that impact the rest of your life, the like the, the rest of your life, you know, because. You know, now, if I think of organizations, I work at one, PwC, it, the, the, the pool of talent is enormous. And every, you know, basically, if you don't have two A's and a B or whatever, if you're not a straight A student, computer says no before you even get to actually what happened here. You know, what happened here? Why is, why is that anomaly? So you know, I find that crazy, but it is a reality. Mm. It's come up so often on this podcast, the the craziness of us expecting children to know what they want to do with their life and, like you say, making those important decisions. I'm curious in the, one of your decisions, so you decided to focus on studying uh, with, with the side order of rugby at Durham. Did you always know that you wanted to go into rugby as a career? Was that kind of the longer term aim at that point? Yeah, it, it, I mean, it was. It was always a huge passion point, but I think also it was underwritten by the fact that um, you know there was doubt in my psyche. I, I think there's natural doubt anyway, of and a realization, a recognition that you know this could all end tomorrow because that always gets said to you from an injury perspective. Um, so that was where that would weigh on my mind for certain. But I also think you know, my dad's influence in that was heavy. You know, you know. When at every stage of progression, you know, whether I got Sussex or England or he'd always be like, son, this is a hobby. Like, when are you going to get a proper job? When are you going to get a proper job? You know, all, all this sort of stuff. Or, or you know, he, he would never come watch any games, but he would he would be you know, the, my biggest critic of stuff. So you doubt yourself in terms of the ability to go forward you know, because uh, an 18, 19, 20 year old, like, oh, I'm going to go and commit to playing rugby. Oh, like, but my dad thinks I'm crap and my dad thinks I should go get a job. You know, so so that was always in the, I would be lying if that wasn't in the back of my mind. But, and I, I mean this genuinely, Durham was the saving grace because I didn't know this at the time, but they combined the two like beautifully for me. It was, I don't think I could have found anywhere else, or I don't know, maybe Loughborough, but but that would probably have been outweigh, outweighted in terms of sport, right? But where I could do what I did, I could get the academic rigor, development, if you like, rubber stamp qualification of very, very credible. I could get that. And at the same time, play university rugby to a very, very, very high standard that allowed me to be in the shop window for a team called Newcastle Falcons who were 20 minutes away. And they were a premiership team with Rob Andrew and Johnny Wilkinson in their team. Right. So who was happened to be the best player in the world and arguably ever. Right. So, yeah. So that for me, and it wasn't a script that I delivered was intentional on, but was poetry in motion. Right. It was absolutely perfect. And so you studied, you then went to Newcastle Falcons? 
I did, yeah. So I went, I was at Durham from whatever is 18, 19 through to 21, 22. And after my first year of being there, uh, I got asked to go. It's quite a good story. I actually invited myself to training. I didn't realize this in the end, but I got asked to go and train with their under 21s team at the end of my first year at Durham. And um, they only had three games left. And I got picked. A, a lad got injured in training. And so they said, oh, look, we haven't got a winger. Would you start on the wing? And I've started the first game, scored a hat-trick. So they couldn't drop me, really. So then I started the next game, scored a hat-trick. And so their final game was at home at Kingston Park. Um, so their, the, the final game was at Kingston Park in Newcastle. Um, and Rob Andrew just happened to come watch, who was the first team head coach at the time, an end of 21 game. And I scored a hat-trick again. So I scored three in a row. And that Rob Andrew at the end of the game was like, who's that Who's that old Benjamin Button lookalike running around on the field? Just won a raffle. Um, let's get him into pre-season. And I, got in, I came into pre-season and the first game, you know, friendly or whatever, was away to Glasgow. And they, they started me for that game. And I scored two. And from then on, I was in the squad. And from then on, I, you know... I played, and I, you know, don't get me wrong, it was a very different experience. I think my contract was £660 a month as opposed to 35 grand a year or something. Um, so very different sort of financial terms, but it was, that, it was the dream, if I'm honest. It was the absolute dream. So you were studying and playing? Yeah, I was for, for my... At the same yeah, time? Yeah, for, for about a year and a half, I was studying and playing at the same time. But I met some very key influential people in my life at that moment in time in 2021 that really shaped you know, I, I went a bit off piece and we'll probably talk about that and towards the end of my 20s early 30s but they really shaped and showed me what values purpose are all about and living and breathing the right lot if you like the right life and that was Wilco definitely in terms of role model and you know, attitude, application, dedication to your trade. But, you know, he he was too far, if I'm honest. He was obsessive, but, you know, but but he was very, he was very good for me um, from a professional perspective. So these were, were they, were you playing with him, with these kind of older players on the team that you were, were there? Correct. Correct, yeah. Yeah, they were at Newcastle Falcons at that point in time. And then we had a fitness coach who was arguably, I mean, he became my surrogate father, really, but who passed away, sadly, a year ago. But um, his name was Steve Black. And I've never met a human being like him, if I'm honest, ever in my life. Just, uh, but, he, but he just told me a few things at the beginning of my career that was, made so much sense, but... But he always said, look, it's common sense, but it's never common practice. And um, and he just said, look, you're going to meet loads of coaches in your life that tell you loads of different things about where you should get better and where you're rubbish at. And every review you'll have, it'll always be about all the negative things that you do. Right. But you're here. You're not here because of all the things that you do wrong. Right. You've got into this team. You've been selected. You've been given a contract because of all the things that you do right. He said, that's your X factor. So every time Ollie Phillips gets the ball, he beats three people and scores tries. So if somebody turns around to you and says, oh, your, you know, your shoelaces are the wrong color or, or your hair looks a bit out, you know, you need to sort this out or you look a bit overweight or you need to get stronger or you need to get faster or you need to do this. Nod, wave, smile and move on. Because he said, I can guarantee you, if you go out every week and score three tries, they're not going to care what your hair looks like. They're not going to care how, how much you weigh or how much you bench press or anything like that, right? Now, he said, that doesn't mean you neglect all the things that help you improve, but he said, like, basically maximize your strengths, manage your weaknesses. That's what he said to me. And, and it just stuck with me forever. And, and then he also said, which is more of a mouthful, but he said, look, the opportunity of a lifetime only exists within the lifetime of the opportunity. So a bit of carpe diem of like, look, 
don't worry about tomorrow. He always used to say, yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, but today's the present. That's why they call it a gift. It sounds like a man of great sayings. He was just, he was the most well-read philosophical human. He was our S and C, but he wasn't. He was a, he was more than that. He was a life coach. What's S most, and C? Strength and conditioning coach. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. But I, I can't. Anybody that has, if you interview anybody, and I mean this, anybody that's either met Steve Black or worked with Steve Black, he will have changed their life in some shape or form. Um. And he, he, so he was just the most positive influence, um, positive influence I've ever had in my life, really. And that and that helped me a lot in those formative years of being a professional athlete, you know, 20 to 25. It was almost the opposite messaging you were getting from your dad, it sounds like, as well. Yeah, complete opposite, which is why I, you know, I was so drawn to him and so, you know, dependent on it i mean i ended up living with his sons or living with his son I, I mean i would go around to blackie's house every night practically and watch jim Rohn or um you know all these you know um seven habits stephen covey or whatever else i'd watch all these things about your mindset and the philosophy that you have on life and anthony robbins and whatever else and um yeah, and he really, I remember I broke my leg and ankle in my first year and he, he he took me in and I lived with him. His wife, him and his wife looked after me for two and a half weeks, three weeks. So just an incredible human being, if I'm honest. And I, I owe a lot to him in terms of like that work ethic and focus that ultimately resulted in me becoming voted as the best player in the world in at the age of 26. So talk a little bit about that trajectory, I can't even say the word, trajectory that you went on. You went from playing, you know, whilst you were at university through to incredible success during your rugby career. Tell me a bit about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's incredible success, if I'm honest. It was very tumultuous because of you know, Newcastle was, I loved it as a region. I was very settled there, as I've said. Uh, uh, some of my favourite you know, memories of my life are up there. but. As a team, we were pretty inconsistent when we didn't win a lot. We had some unbelievable, unbelievably talented players. Never mind, if you if you looked at the team sheet that we had in our first five years, then everybody left and they went to different clubs, and all of them won international honours, leagues. So if we'd have managed to keep everybody together, it would have been incredible. Why do you think you had such a, you know, great individuals that didn't come together for the team then? I think it's just we were young. You know, we mm. all came through at the same period. And anybody that knows their rugby or whatever, you know, my group of players that I came th through with were Matt Tate, Toby Flood, Jeff Parling, Dave Wilson, Lee Dixon, uh, Phil Dowson. All of those players played international rugby for England and or got a British and Irish Lion cap, right? So that that shows you the the wealth of talent that came through at that period. But we you know we were twenty, twenty one, twenty two, so we were still learning the ropes, and you know we they just didn't. Uh, the chairman at the time was particularly negative and had a very you know choice view on how things should be done and as a result you know for example someone like blackie was got rid of that was a you know a, a massive error from their side and then and then everybody left you know, we all left and it, that from my perspective so myself johnny tom may jamie noon we all left in 2009 and all went to france and why france um I think, look, it's it, from from a per. It was a. I got a headhunted or rec scouted, recruited, whatever. For at that point in time, what was probably one of the biggest clubs in Europe, a team called Stade Francais. It was an amazing opportunity for me to go and play for a side where we could be in contention to win stuff, where you know I could play and live in France. So from a life perspective, living in Paris, learning French, uh, but truth be told, the money was mind-blowing compared to what you're getting in Newcastle so every everything about it was positive and I think where things had got to with Newcastle at that point 
I, I couldn't really see a different. Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't really see things changing. So. And how long were you in France for? Uh, three years at the end. Three years. And it was incredible. I mean, I, I got voted as the best overseas player, best best European player, top try scorer in the league. Um, yeah, it was it was a fabulous time. I loved it. And then living in, embracing French culture, living in in Paris, it was just. I'll be honest. I'll be honest. It was absolutely sensational. To what made you come back? Uh, I got I got forced to come back. Really, I. I had a coach that um, just was a bit dishonest, if I'm really honest. An excellent coach. I badly injured my knee in November of 2011. And I could play on it, but I needed a lot of injections to keep playing. Um, and he sort of said, look, I really need you to play. You know, please keep playing. So I kept playing. I'd had four injections in my knee and I kept going on it. And by the end, it was sort of like, I really need to have an operation on this. This is this is going to be problematical. But he'd been promising me from November, look, your contract's coming, contract's coming. And then I got to the March, April, and I was like, there's no contract here, mate. And then they offered me one, and it was you know, basically lower than what I was already on. And I suddenly realized, oh, shit, I've, I've, I'm in a, I'm in a lose-lose situation here. I either take less money at the team, which I ended up, saying look i will take it and by that point then he turned around and said no we're not offering it to you anymore um and uh so i said look i either take less money but equally no other team is going to sign me on the back of like okay we're going to sign a player that has to have basically seven months out after a knee operation so um so that was why i came back i, I didn't really want to come back if i'm honest and then the other part, it was coupled with the fact that the head of head coach for England at the time was a guy called Martin Johnson, and I'd been voted as best European player that year and top try scorer in, in the top 14, which was the French league. And he'd said, look, if you want to be considered for England an England selection, you, you need to be playing in the UK now because you know we, we it's becoming too political and problematical for us to pick players based in France. So... I decided to come back. I had my knee operation, come back to the UK, rehabilitate in the UK, and then find a club. And I found a club in the January of 2012, which was Gloucester. And was that always on the radar, this desire to play for England? Was that something that you'd always wanted? Yeah, I mean, I think... I don't, I, I, maybe I'm stereotyping and generalizing. I don't know, but I think anybody that you know is into sport or whatever or is competitive, it's a it's an amazing. You know, you, you admire and herald these, and you idolize these sort of players. I remember growing up seeing like Will Carling, Rob Andrew running around playing for England, going my dad to Twickenham or whatever, and be like, oh, I'd love to play for England. It'd be so good to play for England and sing the national anthem. And when it arrives. When the moment arrives, it's even better than you ever imagined. So, and then that becomes addictive, and you want to be part of it. And I think, you know, I'm, you know, I'm very proud to be English, um, and and I and I really love the opportunity to represent my country and have a bit of nationalistic pride. And yeah, so for me, it was, you know, it's, and for most people. Well, Definitely playing rugby, I would say, it might, it might not be for everybody, but I'd say it's the pinnacle, right? To represent your country is the pinnacle in sport and um, massive honour. And to be captain of my country was even bigger. So, you know, I think um, I'm just grateful that I was afforded that opportunity and I had the talent and coaches that and players that enabled me to sort of do it, really. Because loads of, there, I'll be honest, there are loads more players and people that are more talented than me that played play the game played the game but didn't get there for whatever reason but i did which is great Wait, i'm interested in that what do you think contributes to someone getting there and someone not um look i think there are the obvious ones the obvious things of you know hard work 
an example, like I would say my brother as a rugby player in his te- late, in his mid teens was more talented than I was as a rugby player in terms of what he could do with the ball and how he could run and move with it. He didn't have any work ethic. He didn't want to work hard. He'll tell you that now himself. So, you know, him and me playing a game of tag or it or whatever, he'd probably always get away from me once, but I'd keep running and I'd keep going and I'd keep running until he basically gave up and then I'd catch him. But at the beginning, I, there's no way he'd evade me. There's no way I'd get anywhere near him. So, you know, I think there's, I've seen loads of talented players never make it just because they, they don't want to put the hard work in. And that's not like, that's not me criticizing them, by the way, because that's just a decision. That's like, I fully respect if they don't want to. But I think if you, if you properly commit to it and you just refuse to refuse the the answer of no, then yeah, obviously you need a certain level of talent, right? But if you, if you ref, just refuse to ever give in, more often than not, great things will happen in person, perseverance. You said earlier about your dad that he has a an obsessive side to his character. You talked about his marathon running. Do you think you've got an element of that as well, of not giving up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there are so many similarities between myself and my father that I see, right? And some of them are incredible. Some of them are, 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 are really great attributes. Um. And some of them I developed that were not so great attributes in my late twenties, early thirties. That, uh, and fortunately, if you like, because I'd seen the damage that they could do on a like an, an infant level, child level in my in my childhood, and then also being cognizant and aware of that in my adulthood life, I was able to change them. I mean, it wasn't an easy change, to, but I was able to to arrest that rot because otherwise, I can get, I guarantee you, I'd be the same person, same person. So you you said there, and you talked about this previously when we were talking. You, you know, it kind of tipped maybe the wrong way in your late twenties, um, in terms of maybe more hedonistic uh, lifestyle. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, I think that. So in my, my 20s to 25, I was just driven. I would be obsessive about what I ate, how often I slept, what I drank. Nothing I would be uncompromising with anyone or anything would get in the way of me and my career. Let's call it that, right? And the result was I became the best player in the world. Right. And I signed for the biggest club in the world. And then... And then I think I basically rode that wave for two or three years of, you know, you, you put in very solid foundations. You can kind of live on those for a bit, but I didn't improve them. I did, I definitely would say when I was at Stade Francais in Paris, my work ethic wasn't bad, but it was nowhere near as intense or as dedicated or as focused as it was when I was at um, Newcastle. You know, when I was at Stad, I'd be up for going out. I'd go and see the city more i'd, I'd drink off the games i'd you know i'd, I'd fraternize well i'd be out till four in the morning i'd never do that in newcastle or you know once in a blue moon whereas at you know at stad i would do it almost every weekend because that was the culture and and because i was still being successful and because i was scoring and whatever else i, I you know i was earning i was earning decent money uh, you know but all of this was the if you like some new foundations that were being sown or, or built upon that were not going to be very conducive to later life because I was starting to, if you like, revel and get interested and addicted uh, to the, let's call it the negative side of professional sport, the money, the women, the, the attention, the fans, the, all this sort of stuff, you know, the celebrity of it all, if you like. Mm-hmm. And then left Stad, went to Gloucester, still sort of riding the wave, then got injured. And at 29, it was all over. Got injured and done. And I remember still wanting to, I was still sort of craving this. You have to, if I explain it, like sport was my avenue for everything. 
everything, every form of social interaction that I had, every form of validation, every form of praise, reward, recognition, everything. And then it was gone and I couldn't execute at all anymore. And so now I was in a new world where I was having to sort of, if you like, develop a new skill, um, but had no credibility or no background in it whatsoever. And equally no idea about what that new skill was going to be. Pritchett, sure. is there any support for that transition? You know, you go from, you know, being a famous rugby player, you know, everything around you, and then all of a sudden you're not. There's nothing there to support you. No, there was nothing. No. I mean, they're, they're getting better now, but there's still relatively nothing. And... And, and I'll be honest, I mean, I have a bit of sympathy for them because it's, I mean, it's very difficult. I mean, what can you do You know, when you've, I don't know, when you've, how do I say, when you've driven a Ferrari, it's very difficult to turn around and say, oh, like, it's okay, like, you know, life, you can still go from A to B and but here's your Skoda or whatever. That's not a discredit to a Skoda, I just don't know what other car to say, right? So, you know, I, I just think it's it's very difficult. You know, there, there were there were lectures and seminars around, like you know, preparing for life after rugby. But but I mean, a you think you're invincible, and b you don't really want to consider that option. And c yeah, it's just it's just not a very desired conversation. But when it happens, the fall from grace is big, big. And actually, that's the one like negative side of that environment and i think it's also the players do it themselves like you deliberately ostracize yourself from that let's call it family or that circle because you feel like a fraud you know you you were uh, originally you know give me the ball i'll do this i'll do that i'll be able to you know i'll score tries i'll do whatever else now you can't deliver your specialism but you're still trying to sort of be in the mixer and be one of the lads and whatever else and you're not you're not you know what I mean, you're not, you know, you're outside the, the circle of trust now, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so instead of sort of being kept in it, some some teams and whatever are, are good at that. But you, know, you you as an individual as well, you're a, your own worst enemy. You deliberately ostracize yourself from that. Like, right, well, I'm going to go smash it somewhere else. Do you question who you are? Because your identity has been so tied up with the sport for so long. For four years, five years, actually longer, of, I mean, even to this day, sometimes it happens, I still introduce myself, I would introduce myself as, hi, I'm Ollie, I used to play rugby. Oh, who'd you play for? I played for Stade Francais, England, oh, I've seen you play, blah, blah, oh yeah, great, great, great. So it was everything like that, who I was before, not like, oh, I'm a director at PwC now and I've, I'm doing this and this and this, because your perception and probably the reality, right, is that's more boring because the perception is loads of people can go work for PwC or whatever else to get a job, but fuck, it'd be cool to play for England. Jesus, like, how do you do that? So that's what you lead with. And that's because you want praise, recognition, people to think you're a legend and whatever else. You lead with that because you think it's going to give you the emotional gratification that you're seeking. Um and so that was me. That was me from the age of 29 to probably mid, you know, 33, 34. That was how I led everything. And a lot of my decisions were driven by that. And if you like, I, I needed that praise, recognition, reward, love, attention, affection. Because that was, if you like, that's what had been absent for me 10 to 20, but it had been present for me from... 20 to let's say 30 and I've become so dependent on it and when it had gone I, I needed it I, ne I I was so isolated and lost without it that I just desperately needed it and I couldn't figure out I wasn't mature enough and I was too driven by my own ego at that point to appreciate that I needed to do some self-reflection and I needed to, to change some things and so my answer to that was I, I thank you know, well, thankfully I, I don't know, but I wasn't into booze. I wasn't into drugs, so that is a a big blessing, right? Because my world could really spiraled. But I was into women, right? I, I needed the the emotional gratification, chemistry, praise, love, 
affection that came from a relationship with a, someone from the opposite sex. But for me, it was from the opposite sex, but from a partner. So, and I would be so ridiculously extreme in order to get that. Because obviously, I, I've never done a drug, but I can imagine what it's like being a drug addict, right? The first time you do it and you go for a drink and you go for dinner, and at the end of the night, you end up sleeping together and it's this amazing, passionate event. And uh, and then they fall in love with you and whatever else. Great, well, that worked now, but I need to, I need more than that now. I need more than that. I need more than that now. I need more than that now. You want the fix again. So I would do, you know, it got to the point where it's utterly I remember taking taking someone to the Bahamas on our second date, you know, in, just because I was going there on holiday anyway. And I was like, oh, you come with me and, yeah, so from there, you know, I was incredibly selfish of me, right? And I'm not proud of it, but at least I can reflect on it. And you know, from their perspective, they're like, "Wow, this this bloke's amazing! Like, what what is this? Like, this is fucking wow!" So it would be like, I don't know, within five six weeks, it would be just so so intense and so passionate, and the chemistry would be so strong. But I was already on the way down. And they were like, oh, you know, I've met this incredible bloke and it's amazing. And we, you know, we see each other every day. And, but, you know, the reality was that there were, there were others. And I was effectively, I was setting myself up for a complete failure because I was never actually reflecting on myself, my own behaviors and my own, you know, needs and whatever else. And, and I was just fueling the problem. And what caused you to reflect? Because it sounds very much like you have done that. Yeah, I'm, I, um, there's a few things that happened. So I was set, when, I, I, when I got injured, I went and did a load of ridiculous adventures. And one of them, the very first one I ever did was I went and sailed around the world. And when I came back from that, I had a massive bust up with my dad. Enormous. And literally the day after. Of coming back of being i was away for a year we had a huge bust up and we didn't speak for three years so or just under two and a half so that was one moment if you like that's ah, uh, you know if you like set the wheels in motion and that culminated i had an incredible um partner girlfriend at the time who who had got pregnant and uh had unfortunately lost the baby on the 12-week scan and Whilst it sounds horrendous, I'm I'm grateful for her because I wouldn't have been the person that she would have wanted me to be and needed me to be, and equally I would have wanted to be as a, as a dad, and I would have cocked everything up. But it still was and is a horrendous thing for her and us to go through at that period of time. And my reaction to that was to be incredibly selfish and egotistical because I was driven by my needs of like I need to feel loved, affect, you know, affection cared for and here's my girlfriend who's sort of wallowing in self-pity i mean incredibly selfish and egotistical of me right but i'm just telling you the honest truth and my re reaction to that was let's get back into this let's get back on with it and obviously she was like i want to grieve like, I, I, this is shit for me and i was like no no, no come on come on come on what, what's the matter with you let's go out let's go see these people let's go do this let's go do that driven by this need for you know affirmation again and positive influence and um and because she wasn't doing that i then you know an ex-girlfriend would message me and i'd be like oh hi how are you It'd be great to see you blah 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 and she found the messages quite rightly went apoplectic and threw me out of the house and i i remember because i was doing another expedition to the north pole and it was two days before i was going to the north pole um and when i got back from the north pole she came around to my house probably three or four weeks later she'd been out drinking and well, she isn't in a great state when she drank drinks. Anyway, she turned up at my flat. I was in a basement flat at one in the morning, wearing my dressing gown, smashing on my front door, and I had come back to my house with a girl, another girl in my room. And I remember being there, and her smashing on the front door, and I couldn't let her in. I couldn't acknowledge that I was in the house in the flat. And so I sat on the other side of the door with my back to the door. She was on the other side of the door outside screaming crying and she fell asleep on the floor of my basement terrace or whatever outside until five in the morning and i just remember looking and then obviously this girl was sort of stood in my door frame of like what the fuck is this you know what is this situation who is this bloke that you know you know just 
it just it just that moment in time i was like hold on ollie like you've got this image and picture of this loyal trustworthy incredible sort of family person that has good values and that you promised and that you you'd practice and you would spoken about hours on end with steve black in his room constantly over and over and again around like just living and having amazing principles and everything that you're doing is contradicting them everything everything and you've spent the last five years or 10 years or whatever blaming everybody else you know ending a relationship oh she was a nutcase or you know it's not you it's me or whatever whatever nonsense i was convincing every myself of at the time you know i had this delusion that just this miraculous incredible right woman would just appear and that would be it done finished don't have to work on anything ever again if honest it doesn't work like that it's exactly like it was when i was a 19 year old 20 year old lad like i want to be the best in the world like and as a result i need to be dedicated focused i need to be honest and act with all the best levels of best principles and values and not compromise on anything in pursuit of being the best player in the world well it's the same of being the best person in the world the best dad and whatever it is right and all you're doing is cutting every corner and basically lying to yourself and lying to everybody else and that moment with crying her eyes out on the floor and this girl stood in my door frame and me not having the courage to open the door or talk to the girl that had in the house just sort of sitting there i was like right you you need to do something about this and so i rang up our players union that we have called the rpa and just said look um i I don't know if you've got any support but i I think i'm in a pretty bad place i i I think i need some help here around me and because if i don't if i don't get this help now i'm gonna self-destruct i'm gonna i'm not gonna be the person that i want to be or that i aspire to be and all that's going to happen is i'm going to end up hurting people and yeah maybe next time it's you know they will get pregnant they will go through and three years down the line i'll cock it up and then that'll be a proper disaster that will be the pits for me that will be if you like the i don't know is it the antithesis i don't know what the word but the total opposite of everything that i've ever aspired and hoped for and if you like everything that i ever longed for as a having experienced it as a kid you know, now i've got three children of my own and an incredible wife and incredible family the one thing that i want now is to is to be the best possible dad i can be for them and you know i i recognize that in order for me to, i recognize then if you like in order for me to achieve that and do that i needed to do some massive self-reflection and some self-adjustment and reassessment and whatever else and that was it i'm conscious you need to go soon ollie um i'm, I'm just so fascinated with what you've been saying i didn't notice the time um in terms of i mean i don't want to at all kind of move so swiftly on from that very uh raw description actually of what you were just talking about but you have kind of turned your life around you do have a very happy family life you have lovely kids um beautiful wife where what's next like where are you going on this kind of new trajectory both work-wise and personally yeah i mean i I think i'm wrong i don't think it's ever a case of you know life sorted Mm -hmm. you know and and i think you've always got goals aspirations dreams of things you want to achieve and go for right there's nothing what i'm saying is there's nothing wrong with that you know that was that's if you like been a a cornerstone of my life i think that my drivers or the things that were underpinning it or the things that i was chasing were rotten they they weren't going to bring me the fulfillment that i wanted right they weren't going to give me the outcomes that i desired even though i thought they would and the and the honest truth is that you know they're really attractive for a, a moment right now, i don't know chatting somebody up and going out and having a shag or whatever out doing something wild and exciting it you know gives your pulses racing it's you know but but if it's done in a if it's dishonest right then it's 
then at the, at the core of it, it's rotten. And, and as a result, the outcome is rotten, right? You don't ever work towards what it is that you want, what you desire. And then you need to ask questions about like, well, actually, do I really want this? Is it that important? And if it is, okay, well then you need to change some stuff. Or if it isn't, okay, well then you need to reassess your goals, but don't keep pretending like you want to be this incredible family person. If really what you want to do is go and have multiple relationships and, and, and be aloof and dishonest and whatever else because they're they're not you know they're not um conducive to one another right they're not compatible um yeah it's not going to take you where you want to go and so to, to answer your question like now where i think you know like if you like the next decade 40 to 50 for me it's about how do i uh, look, like one thing I have recognized in the 40 years I've been on the planet, life is about stories. Life is about experiences. And really, that's what my business is about, Optimus Performance, what we've founded it all on, right, is about creating amazing experiences for people to be able to touch and feel and recognize the values or the behaviors that they want to elicit, right? And the next 40 years, I've got well, four, including my wife, but three of the most incredible human beings that are going to be dependent on me and my wife for the next 20 years. And I want to create an amazingly safe, but, you know, but challenging, but, you know, supportive and educational environment I can for them, but create some amazing stories and amazing moments and memories that because for for me on a personal level, that is what life is all about. Like I, I want to be able to lie down on my deathbed whenever that is and and be able to reflect and be like, God, I'll tell you what, what, what ride? What, what, you know, and equally, whoever sat next, to, hopefully there's some people sat next to me because I've built some amazing relationships and, and, and what have you and say, you know, do you remember when we did this? Do you remember when we did that? And, and, and that, for me is what makes life exciting and worth living is is that shared experience because um i i need people right i i need them in my life i need i need as i've already demonstrated throughout the whole thing and but but i need them to be there for all the right reasons and for for pure reasons and um and so that's yeah i'm not saying i'm ever going to get it right and i'm i'm but but that's what i want that that's the that's the goal that's the aim and aspiration and what advice would you give to your younger self oh great question what would i say to me i think uh, you know what i don't i don't regret any of it because if i hadn't have gone through the experience i went through as a 10 year old whilst i would never like that for that to have happened so it it probably wouldn't have given me the drive and determination and focus to go and do what I did from a rugby perspective. Um, now, yes, the, the drivers and everything underneath it were probably not the right ones, right? Because I was ultimately playing sport because I wanted and needed the affirmation and confirmation and whatever else that we've spoken about. But... But I'm grateful for that experience. I'm grateful for those things that I did in my life. I feel like that is an incredible achievement, the one that I'll never, ever, if you like, that's a story I'll never, ever forget of playing for England. And I'll be eternally grateful for that. Um, but, but but I would equally have loved for it to be different. You know. But But I think one thing I've realised, if you like, in that, transition period of in my early 30s of doing some self-reflection and it took me a long time it took me two to three years to really wrestle through all this stuff and you know some pretty dark depressive days in the in the middle in the midst of it but you know what i what it made me really realize and reflect on was that i, I can't control anybody else i can't control their reaction their sentiment their behaviours and ultimately their feedback to me. And whilst that's, you know, I want it to be positive, I became dependent on that. I needed that in order for me to progress and feel validated in life. And 
what I would tell myself as a younger self is like, just worry about you. Worry about you. Just focus on how you behave, how you react, how you live true to yourself and how you deliver the best version of yourself every single day. And if you worry about that and you focus on that, you'll never disappoint yourself because ultimately a lot of my drivers would, were really driven for probably 10, 20, 10, 15 to 20 years, let's say, or 10 to 15 years. By my whole self-worth being determined by the outcome of what somebody else said. So if my dad said the wrong thing, I, it would deflate me immediately. If Blackie said I'm brilliant, well, I'm brilliant. If a coach picked me for the weekend, I'm awesome. If I got selected to be a cap for England, amazing, because somebody else thinks I'm brilliant. But none of it was like, none of it was about, okay, well, uh, okay, cool. You don't want to pick me this weekend. No problem. Like, you know. Like, I think I should be there. I feel like I'm ready. I'm, I feel great. I'm going to keep working. But, you know, your choice, if you don't want to pick me, that, you know, whereas I would get very affected by those sorts of things, by what everybody else thought and what everybody else said, rather than just making it about me. Um, and so that, that would be probably the biggest thing that I would, you know, try and, and coach myself. And my final question before you go, what would you give a strap line or a title to your story? Well, I mean, I'd love it, that one for Blackie. The opportunity of a lifetime only exists within the lifetime of the opportunity. But if I were to say anything, just be more Blackie. Oh, I love that. <laughs> really love that. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks so much for being so honest and open. I literally was just so fascinated with what you were saying. I really appreciate how you've been able to be really uh, honest and sincere. So thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm sorry that I've got to dash away early, but you know, let's do it again sometime. Brilliant. Thanks again. Thanks, Enjoy buddy. the rest of your day. Cheers. You too. Have a great week. Bye bye. Bye. That was such a fascinating conversation and there were so many things that stood out to me, not least how honest and open Ollie has been in his conversation with me and I really genuinely appreciate that. There were a couple of things that perhaps stood out more than others. One was this, this sense of where do we get our validation from? Is it an internal or an external thing? And, and the impact that it can have on us when we're really... Uh, focusing too much on um, seeking external validation and are not able to generate that from within ourselves. And the second thing was really that I would have loved to have met Steve Black. He just sounds an amazing man. His, this podcast episode is named after him. Um, and I loved uh, the sayings that Ollie was sharing with us. He, he really sounded like the, the Yoda of rugby to me. So um, yeah, really appreciate Ollie sort of carrying on that wisdom, I suppose, and sharing the message uh, even after Steve has gone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Secret Resume. If you did, remember to like, share, comment and subscribe as that helps people like you find people like us.